Let me open our equipping hour with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, when we pause just a moment to think about the cross and the work that your son did there to remove our sin by taking our sins upon himself, by enduring your holy wrath, and by removing them as far as the east is from the west, by taking that which was scarlet and making it white as white wool or like snow. That you have reasoned with us, not on the basis of our deeds, but on the basis of your mercy and the grace and the gospel. And if we never got another good thing from you in this life, we would indeed have everything. That is grounds for us, O Lord, never to be angry. And yet we find ourselves provoked on a daily basis, an hourly basis, perhaps a moment by moment basis at inconveniences, at unmet expectations, at the poking at our idolatries, our greeds, our coveting, those things which produce in us a rebelling against your goodness and kindness and favor. Our anger puts on display what we believe, and we pray even in the exposure of it this morning that you would be glorified in our turning from sinful anger. That we pray that we would see what we need to see, that misplaced priorities would bubble to the surface, that wrong theology uh, would come to the fore, and that we would be different as we walk away. We pray that we'd be changed by your word. We pray that we'd be renewed by the gospel and strengthened by your spirit to put to death those things which are displeasing to you. And we ask for your help in it, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you were looking at the schedule and what was published for Equipping Hour, uh, you had seen that this morning's topic would be on waiting. And at the risk of creating stumbling blocks for you as it relates to anger and impatience, this is anger part two. And so you'll have to wait on waiting. And you might be angry about it. So... This morning, we'll pick up where we left off last week, and we'll put the whole outline up on the screen for you. This is just sort of the ladder rungs as we make our way up this this ladder of biblical view of sinful anger. We looked at the posture of anger, and you remember that we saw last week that the posture of anger is the posture of the judge. One who is in a superior position to assess someone else. And, and while the, the angry man is judge, he is also prosecutor, plaintiff, jury, and sometimes executioner. And Jesus tells us that the end result of sinful anger is murder. And that's why murder and anger are interesting hand-holding friends in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He, he told us that if you have anger in your heart, you've, you've murdered your brother. There is a, a murder of relationships in this kind of anger. And it comes from the posture of superiority. We also saw some of the mechanisms of anger. It's not always an, an outlandish outburst of physical violence or verbal abuse. It can be silence, indifference, ignoring, separation. We talked about the effectiveness of anger, that anger gets things done. Uh, You can change the behavior of people who are under you or beside you by being angry. It's actually highly effective. But we looked at the effects that anger has that are notoriously negative. Uh, The dividing of relationships, the the creation of adverse fear, uh, the kinds of provocations that separate children from their parents and break apart friendships. We talked about the folly of anger that according to the book of Proverbs, the fool who is not some silly clown that just sort of has his wire crossed and doesn't know how to do some stuff, but is actually the recalcitrant rebel against God's wisdom who is hell bound and whose life will not go well. That's the fool in Proverbs. Uh, We discovered the folly of anger. The the man characterized by anger is that biblical fool. Uh, We looked at the opportunities uh, for anger. Um, Those things which provide for us 
situations where anger that is resident in our hearts comes out. And then we looked at the biblical prohibitions against sinful anger. And and we spent some time there. So where we pick up this morning is to sort of unpack what anger is at the heart level. We'll look at the roots of anger, the theology of anger. That is what you believe about yourself, what you believe about the gospel, what you believe about God that your anger reveals. And then we'll look at some of the opposites of anger. If we are to put anger to death, what goes in its place? If we're to put it off, what are we to put on? And then finally this morning, we'll look at the righteousness of anger. And just to let the cat out of the bag, right, uh, anger all by itself is not necessarily sin. God's angry. Jesus was angry at times in his earthly ministry. And so we'll talk about the categories of, of righteous anger. Let's begin with the roots of anger. And thinking back to our equipping hour on repentance, how do I deal with sin? It's important to look at the fruit on the tree. You got bad fruit on a tree, but it's helpful to remember to ask, what limb is this fruit hanging off of? What is the condition of that limb and the trunk and the tree and its roots and the soil that it's in? And in other words, we're not content to look at a a surface level. Hey, I blew my top. I need to not do that anymore. But what is underneath the kind of anger that comes out of us. Why is it provoked? What are we protecting? What are we wanting that we're not getting? We need to look at the roots of anger, and that will lead us to the unbelief that underlies anger. That's going to lead us to the theology of anger. So if you're thinking about that tree picture from our lesson on repentance, uh, this is kind of what we're doing. We're looking at the, the fruit hanging way out on the limb, some sort of outburst, some sort of impatience, uh, some sort of silent in- treatment, indifference of someone else that comes from, I'm not happy with what happened to me. I'm not happy with what you did to me. And ultimately, I'm not happy with how God is ordering my circumstances. We're looking at the tree. Where where does that fruit come from? So, Brian Borgman, in his helpful book, Feelings and Faith, the subtitle of that book is Cultivating Godly Emotions in the Christian Life. He says, anger tells us much about ourselves if we listen. Anger expresses our values and our evaluations And it also influences motives and conduct. And he concludes that by saying, anger is something we feel and do. You cannot relegate anger to something that simply happens to you. You can't relegate anger simply to an emotion that you didn't see coming. It wells up from inside you. It flows out of the heart, as Jesus said. And so we need to understand what is in the heart that drives anger. And the first thing I want to highlight is simply unmet desires. Unmet desires. Turn to Jonah chapter 4. We looked at this last week. We, I want to look at this from the frame of reference of, of asking the question, what am I not getting that I want? Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, it's in there somewhere. Page 1,245 in my Bible. It's probably different in yours. When I'm angry, in a very real sense, I am not getting what I want. I am am provoked because something is not meeting my expectations. Perhaps I think I'm not getting what I deserve. Uh, Maybe I'm getting what I don't want, or maybe I, I am getting what I think I don't deserve. And we come back to Jonah 4 and and we look at Jonah's anger. Think about it through that lens. Jonah 4, 1. This was a great evil to Jonah and he became angry. Now, what was the great evil? The the Hebrew word there is ra. It just means a bad. This This was a bad to Jonah. Sometimes it means moral evil. Sometimes it means a physical calamity. A hurricane can be described as a ra, a bad. And sin can be described that way. Here, Jonah is just saying, this is awful. This is terrible. This is a bad. What, what is the bad he's talking about? That Ninevites repented and believed Yahweh. 
that they were rescued from imminent disaster by the mercy of God and Jonah himself as the instrument of God to preach coming judgment and they turned and repented in sackcloth and ashes. An entire generation of Ninevites saved. This was a raw, an evil, a bad to Jonah and he became angry. Why was Jonah angry? He didn't get what he wanted. What did Jonah want? If you were to unpack his anger... If you were to to take his beating heart out of his chest and and hold it in front of him, throbbing, what did it say? I want all the Ninevites dead. What's underneath his anger? Murderous intent. Now, would it be right at one level for Ninevites who hated Yahweh, worshipped pagan gods, and were oppressors of God's people Israel to die in their sins? Yes, that would be holy and just and true in God's economy. And yet, God seeks for his own purposes, for his own glory's sake, for his own namesake, to have mercy on undeserving rebels that didn't even see his mercy coming, didn't even know to ask for it. Now, that is a tremendous help to us Gentiles sitting here. God is going to be kind to outsiders? And Jonah was angry because that was a bad to him. And so he prayed in his anger and says, Yahweh, this is exactly what I told you. This is what I said to you when I was at home. That's why I ran away. That's why I went the opposite direction of where you told me to go. That's why I ended up on that boat in the storm and in the belly of a fish. Told you, you're slow to anger and you're abundant in grace and you relent concerning evil. Here, Jonah is actually have sound theology and just doesn't like it. It's pretty remarkable. And look at the extent of his anger, verse 3. So, Yahweh, please take my life from me. Death is better to me than life. What does Jonah want right here in verse 3 that he's not getting? End of life. He would rather die than live with the Ninevites experiencing grace. Stunning. By the way, I do think Jonah wrote this book after all of these things. And leaves us with this really terrible picture of himself in chapter 4. I think it's actually a humble author that writes such a thing in the end. But this is an exposure. Yahweh says, verse 4, do you have good reason to be angry? There's no, there's no verbal reply from Jonah. He just goes outside the city and pouts. He went and sat east of the city. He made a booth for himself. He sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen. Yahweh appointed a plant. It came up. Now Jonah was extremely glad about the plant. Okay, evil, 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 God's kind of Ninevites. But at least I have some shade while I sit here and wait to see if they're all going to meet their demise. God appointed a worm, verse 7, at the breaking of the dawn of the next day. Struck the plant. Plant dried up. The sun rose, verse 8, God appointed a scorching east wind. That tormented Jonah, and he said, I want to die. Again, death is better to me than life. What is Jonah not getting that he wants that makes him angry? Death. He'd rather die than see the Ninevites survive under God's grace. Yahweh said, verse 10, you had pity on the plant for which you did not work, which you did not cause to grow. It came up overnight and perished overnight. Should also I not have pity on Nineveh, the great city? More than 120,000 persons, probably that aren't old enough to know the difference between right and left hand. And then also many animals. God looks down on his creation, cursed and rebellious as it is, and wants to bestow kindness. And Jonah's angry. This unmet desire in Jonah is obviously errant. You can be angry about things where your perspective is right, but here Jonah is angry about things and his perspective is wrong. He does not have the heart of God here. And so this unmet desire results in a near suicidal sort of anger. How angry do you have to be that you would rather die than keep going? 
So Jonah's expectations of others is not being met. And, and you and I can have that. We can have expectations for other people that, that, that aren't being met. We, we meet this kind of provocation in traffic. Why is that guy behind me going so fast? Why is that guy in front of me going so slow? Everybody should drive like I do and the world would be happy and then I wouldn't be angry. No, angry's inside of me. You got opportunities to see it well up. Unmet expectations, unmet desires. A second root of anger we have to deal with is pride. The pride that underlies anger is the pride that says, I am Lord, I am in charge, my will should reign, my preferences should rule, and it's my ideas that are being crossed right now. I am offendable by your imperfections. I'm offendable by the way you inconvenience me. I'm offendable by your shortcomings. Kids don't live up to their parents' expectations. Anger. Other people don't do what you're thinking they should think that you're thinking about doing. Anger. And a lot of these areas of, of pride don't have to do with actual sins, actual shortcomings, but just people have not oriented their lives around a Smedley-centered universe. They should know better. Turn to James chapter 4. Look at verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, we'll spend a year there, we'll engage in business and make a profit. That sounds like taking the initiative. That sounds like doing the right thing, the next thing that must be done. What's missing in verse 13? If the Lord wills, Deo Valente. A submission to a higher authority than self. This is the pride of self-sufficiency. And the answer in verse 14 is, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You can make all these plans. You're actually a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. What you should say is, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your Arrogance. There it is. There's a pride. And all such boasting is evil. This is a remarkable window into making our plans and our plans being upset. And why are we angered by that when things didn't go the way we thought they should? Well, because we have the underlying pride that says, my plans ought to be the Lord's will. I'm not even going to ask him. I'm not even giving consideration to that. The corrective is, well, I'd, I'd like to go to that city and do some business. I'd, I'd like to go here next year. I'd like to do this or that, if the Lord wills. This pride, which underlies our anger at inconveniences, changes of plan, a, a whole bunch of sentient beings, about 8 billion of them, interfering with what we think we should be doing next. Ed Welch, in his book on anger, says, What makes us so important that life must go according to our plans? Why should we be the center of the universe? He says, we cannot script the events in our lives. When life throws us unexpected trouble, an arrogant person gets angry because his or her kingly rights have been violated. A servant, however, who realizes his insignificance says, if the Lord wills. Listen, if you're in the, pa in the pattern, the habit of thinking, if the Lord wills, I will do such and such. You're actually conveying the notion of a servant who does not deserve anything. Who can make plans, take initiative, go places, do things, but all under the banner of God's plans are way better than mine. I'm ready for his interruptions. I'm ready for the way that he will use means and instruments, even the instrumentation of 8 billion sinful people who aren't thinking about me, to overrule my little plans. 
The pride of self-sufficiency has to go away if anger is to go away. Anger acts out of self-protection, self-promotion, self-preservation. Anger is the pride of self-reliance acting out when someone or something gets in the way. What should we do before something? We should say, if the Lord wills. What should we do during the something? We should probably say, well, this is what the Lord has for me. What should we say after the something? This was God's doing. Uh, That is a humble perspective that if we could do that every time, here's what I have planned for for the day, but Lord, this is your day. I'm going to walk into it uh, with open hands and a humble heart and let your will be done, not my will be done. And and if it is your will, I'm going to go about these things. And when those things don't happen, in the moment we say, Lord, what's happening right now is what you have for me. And at the end of the day, Lord, thank you for what you did. If if we could employ the sovereignty of God applied to life, combined with a biblical anthropology, a right view of ourselves, I think we would get rid of a lot of sinful anger. The result of saying, if the Lord wills, or this is what the Lord has for me, or that was the Lord's doing, could go one of two ways. You could have the soft-hearted approach that says, the judge of all the earth will do right. He is good, and he does good, and I trust him, and boy, my plans, if, if I'd gotten my way, things would have been a lot worse. He knows what he's doing. Praise the Lord. A man plans his steps, and the Lord directs his path. That's good news. Or you could get hard in your heart. And so I don't like what God does. Bitterness, complaining, discontentment ensues. If you are angry at your circumstances, you have to know you are angry at God, the one who has ordered your circumstances. And it's good just to be honest about that. At least least you see your heart for what it is. There's another root we should deal with, and this is the root of idolatry. Also in James chapter 4, we read this last week in the prohibition against anger. James is something of a a scientist, a, a doctor who's examining a disease and diagnosing how that disease works. What's underneath it? What are the underlying causes? And then what are the manifestations of it? He says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you murder. And again, I think James there is referring to murder in the metaphorical sense that Jesus referred to when he talked about anger. You are envious and cannot obtain. You fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You do not ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, friendship with the world, hostility to God. This is idolatry. You love something more than you love God. This is the the underlying bottom of anger. James describes these deep-seated desires. They become ruling desires. Listen, I can want something, and then when the want starts to tell me what to do, how to live, what to think, choices to make, then it becomes a ruling desire. And then it becomes an illicit desire, as James identifies, when it turns into greed, coveting. Somebody else has it and I don't. I want it. Somebody else has it, and I'd rather them not have it if I can't have it. Envy and jealousy leading to murder. Uh, Now, whether James was writing to a bunch of people who had actually knocked each other off over their stuff, or whether he's referring to the metaphorical murder that murders relationships called anger, the end result of these illicit desires breaks things apart. It is what underlies the quarrels and conflicts. And all of that is grounded in faithlessness, unbelief, if you will. 
That is, you, you didn't ask God. It, it was a lack of prayer. Listen, you, you can have a desire and ask God for it. And, and if the Lord wills, he can say yes, no, maybe, later, or never. And it's good. If you're not going to God, this is faithlessness in your interaction with your desires. And it became ruling desires, particularly when you leave God out of the picture and you let your desires tell you what to do rather than letting God tell you what to do with those desires. This was the fundamental problem of Solomon. Remember in 1 Kings 8, he dedicates the, the temple, the Solomonic temple, in this magnificent, kingly, doxological prayer before all of the people. Here you have a king of the reigning world superpower on his knees before the people in humble worship of the true king, leading the people. Three chapters later, we find Solomon in 1 Kings 11 attaching himself in love to the foreign women who took his heart away towards their idols. Probably political expediency. You married the daughter of your enemy so that the armies wouldn't fight each other. But he attached himself in love to them. And three chapters after the dedication of the temple, he's building Asherah poles and monuments to Molech in Israel. What does that tell you? A governing desire was then Solomon's Lord. This is the problem with our, our desires. We can have desires that are good. We can have desires that are intrinsically bad. But both of them get lumped into the pile of illicit desires when they govern us. When they are master. And they produce what James describes as this horizontal quarreling, fighting, and anger murder. And then James goes on to say that when you do ask... You're asking God to fulfill your idolatries. You are a spiritual adulterer. You're two-timing. You, 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 you want to talk to God, but you want to talk to God about fulfilling the things that displease Him. Don't you know that is hostility to Him? Hey, God, can I have more of that stuff that you hate in my life? Because I really like it right now. This, this penetrates... Robert Jones, in his book on anger, says what James 4, 1 to 3 teaches is that our anger comes from the sinful desires that rule our hearts. And those desires are often not for bad things, but for good things we want too badly. It's a good diagnosis. Brian Borgman, in his book on emotions, says, What am I not getting that I am elevating to idle status and willing to go to war over? That is what James is getting at. So what is your anger saying about you? What does your anger reveal? What good desires, bad desires, wrongly elevated to ruling desires, which become illicit desires, which become faithless pursuits, or even idolatries. What's in there? What unmet expectations do you have? How high a view of yourself are you maintaining? Oh, let's talk about your lack of faith. Let's talk about your idolatries. All of that is what an outburst of anger or seething, settled anger gives you opportunity to look at. It's, it's not just a, 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 a character flaw. Oh man, that guy's got a short fuse. That's all right. He's a really good guy. Um, don't stop there in your self-assessment. It's not okay. That short fuse reveals stuff on the inside that must be dealt with or it will kill you. It'll destroy the relationships around you. It could be a revealer of a fundamental lack of faith. Let's move to the theology of anger. We need to know not just what does my anger say about me. We need to know what my anger says about my creed, my doctrinal statement, uh, my theology. I need to know what my anger says about God. We, we can sing orthodox songs. We can proclaim orthodox doctrine. You can get in an angry, knockdown, drag-out debate over theological truths. 
But your anger is proclaiming things about your theology louder than your creedal statements are. So what does my anger say about God? Particularly God's sovereignty, his goodness, his love, the gospel. We need to look at these things. And, and really, you could take all of God's attributes as listed in Scripture and run them through the grid of, when I'm angry, what am I saying about God's fill-in-the-blank attributes? We'll just highlight several of them. Turn to Psalm 84. <clears throat> Anger, because it is vertically directed from the heart, even if we've sort of masked it as justifiable based on our horizontal circumstances, God, the one who is sovereign over all things, orders our circumstances, and our anger is therefore vertical. Our anger is an assault on the goodness of God. Look at Psalm 84, 11, and 12. For Yahweh God is a sun and shield. Yahweh gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk blamelessly. O Yahweh of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. Now don't get tripped up at the end of verse 11 with the phrase, those who walk blamelessly and think, oh, I haven't. I sinned on the way to church this morning. I guess I, I, guess I don't get the goodness of God. I guess he will withhold from me because I didn't drive blamelessly. That's not the point of this verse. The, those who walk blamelessly, those who walk uprightly, is a categorical statement of the faithful. We're not talking about sinless perfection here. We're talking about those who believe. How do we know this in the context? Notice the poetic parallelism in verses 11 and 12. No good thing does Yahweh withhold from those who walk blamelessly. O Yahweh of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. Do you see it? Blessing, no good thing withhold, withheld, are on equal footing in this poetic parallel statement. And those who walk blamelessly and faith are equal in the poetic parallel statement. What is the psalmist saying? For those who belong to Yahweh on the basis of faith, not on the basis of their merits, but on the basis of his grace, they are blessed because God is not stingy. God is not holding back. God is not saying to you, hey, there's a bunch of good stuff out there. Everybody else gets it. But you know what? Um, when you lied to your dad about chopping down the apple tree, you know, back when you were five year old, I'm holding that against you. So all good things I'm withholding from you. That is not God's disposition towards his people. He forgives, and then he gives and gives and gives and gives. And if God is seeing fit right now to give you hardship, you must know it's good. He's not withholding good. He's giving you good. And if God is pleased right now to give you a break from hardship and wonderful health and sweet relationships and fine meals and easy money, watch out. <laughs> Because those are very good gifts from God, and your flesh could be tempted to forget Him. All of these things, whether hardship or pleasant things, all in the good dispensation of God to His people in this life, point us to the future. I go back to Calvin's Meditations on the Future Life, comes out of his institutes, where he says, if you're having a bad day, that's a reminder that you're not home yet. And if you're having a great day, that's an appetizer for the goodness that is to come in infinite measure. This statement that Yahweh does not withhold good from those that are his, that he blesses those who trust him, is a reminder that God is good. And when we are angry at our circumstances, we are saying God's not good. Or <laughs> in Jonah's case in Jonah 4, God was so good to the Ninevites that I hate him for it, and I'd rather die. <laughs> our anger undermines our theology about the goodness of God. Our anger also undermines our belief and proclamation of the sovereignty of God. Turn over to Psalm 115. Verse 3. 
This is a classic statement on the sovereignty of God and the macro and the micro. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. No one's stronger than God. God's in charge. He's sovereign. He's king. He's creator and sustainer. Nobody does something that's a surprise to God. R.C. Sproul said there is no rogue molecule in the universe. God's in charge. And so our anger is a statement about his sovereignty. Either he's not in charge and he needs to hurry up and get over here and fix it, get back on track, or we don't like his sovereignty. We don't like him being in charge. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 because we have a, a complaint about the sovereignty of God in the church at Corinth, in the dispensing of spiritual gifts for the use in the church. Look at verse 7, 1 Corinthians 12. To each person is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what is profitable. And here you have the listing of spiritual gifts, some of which were uh, available and appropriate to the first generation of believers in the foundational age. Others endure to our own time. But the point in all of these is that God gives out a variety of gifts. Look at verse 11. One in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Look at verse 15. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But God has appointed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. This is God's sovereignty applied to the varieties of gifts exercised in a local church. Why is Paul writing this to Corinth? Because they got it backwards. The Corinthian believers were infatuated with big names and celebrities. They were selfish. They were suing one another. Uh, they, they, they weren't dealing with sin, 1 Corinthians 5. And here at the exercise of supernatural spiritual gifts... They gravitated towards the showy things, the things that would edify self rather than edify the body. And the whole letter serves as a correction to their self-absorption. And I think if you sort of read behind the letter here, you understand that Corinthian believers needed to be corrected on their view of varieties of gifts in the body of Christ. It was a provocation to them that that guy got to do cool stuff in the church and I don't get to do that. What am I? An armpit in the body of Christ? Well, look, the body needs one. <laughs> if that's how God suits, that's what he's built you for. Be the best there ever was and help the body out. That's the purpose. This is God's sovereignty applied to variations in the economy of how he works out his plans with his people. If we don't like it, are we to be angry with our brother? Hey, you're an eye. I'm not an eye. I wanted to be an eye. I don't like you. Uh, Paul just redirects this. You're actually angry at God. And, and God's good and God knows what he's doing. Uh, and anger reveals a, a wrong view of his sovereignty. And next, our anger reveals a wrong view of the love of God. Listen to Romans 12, 19. Never take your own revenge... Beloved, do you hear that? Never take your own revenge. If it stopped right there, we'd be tempted when we're wrong to say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. You don't know what he did. Justify, justify, justify. Him and haw. If you had only seen, you would know that how I'm feeling about this is correct. I've been wronged. Until you get to the word, beloved. We just had 12 chapters in Romans about the love of God for people who had no business being in the love of God. 
Get to Romans 5 and the fruit of justification is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he gave us. God's definition of love was not we cleaned ourselves up, made ourselves right, not that we were worthy of his love, but when we were at our worst, Christ died for us. Very rarely would somebody die even for a good guy. Okay, a Marine will jump on a grenade for his buddies. That's rare, that's uncommon. But God demonstrated his love for us in this while we were his enemies. Christ died for us. Don't take revenge, beloved. Our anger undermines our theology of the love of God. Is there a more precious, active attribute that crosses paths with us sinners than the love of God and the gospel? And our anger undermines it. Paul goes on in that verse to say, leave room for the wrath. Right? We could add other attributes here, God's justice and holiness. Our anger interferes. The anger of man does not accomplish the things of God. God will take care of stuff in the end. Leave room for that. How much room do you have to leave for infinite wrath? All the room. All the room. Our, our anger also undermines the theology of forgiveness. Turn to Matthew 18. You know the parable. And the whole chapter of Matthew 18 is, is just these wonderful stories. Um, who's the greatest? Uh, humility. Um, get rid of stumbling blocks because God loves his children. Lost sheep, lost son, these things all fall into the category of what Jesus is dealing with in Matthew 18. You, you get to the Matthew 18 process in verse 15 and following about how to care for one another when we sin. And then you get the parable beginning in verse 21. Peter is no doubt impressed with Jesus' words about forgiveness and seeking the lost sheep and not being a stumbling block and who's really important in the kingdom. It seems like some of this is sinking in. And so Peter says, hey, I'm ready to forgive my brother. Oh, I bet I could do it seven times. And, and we shouldn't miss how impressive that would sound. I mean, listen, if, if somebody that you cared about sinned against you four and a half times in the same way and pleaded with you for forgiveness, you might give up. Not Peter. Seven. <laughs> what does Jesus say? Try 490. Let's just do some multiplication here. Let's put it at a level you would never have considered. And then let me tell you a story. Verse 23, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began to settle them, one owed him 10,000 talents. Talent is the biggest denomination. 10,000 is the biggest number. Maybe we're intended not to put any math on this, but just for fun, years ago, I considered a $10 an hour wage. A talent was more than 15 years wages. $10 an hour wage, which is archaic now, amounts to $3.75 trillion. If you put it on a credit card, you would owe $532.5 billion annually or $44.375 billion every month on interest at 15%. That's a lot of money. And what does the slave say when the king comes to settle accounts? Have mercy on me and I'll pay back every penny while I'm in jail with my family and no way to make money. And even if I had my job back at $10 an hour, could I really cover the $44.375 billion a month in interest alone? No, how soon will you begin to pay down the principal of the $3.75 trillion? Never, and that's the point. He was forgiven an infinite and increasing debt. Why? Because the king felt compassion. Verse 28, that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii. Same math gives you 8,000 bucks. And he seized him and began to choke him, pay back what you owe. Now listen to the words of the fellow slave, pleading with him, have patience with me and I will repay you. Listen, 8,000 bucks is a lot. I think I'd want it back. And, and this guy... Maybe he could have paid back the $8,000. 
If only the man had been patient. But he was unwilling, threw him in prison. His fellow slaves saw it. They reported to the king. The king, the Lord, summoned him, you wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Couldn't you not have mercy on your fellow slave? And the Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. How long would that take? Forever and ever and ever. Obviously, this parable uh, is teaching about forgiveness at a vertical level and at a horizontal level. What does our anger reveal about our belief about the gospel, about what we've been forgiven? Listen, we have grounds to never be angry ever because we've been forgiven so great a debt. And we, when we are angry, sinfully angry, horizontally with others, we are screaming out loud, I do not believe the gospel anymore. I do not get it. I do not understand it. I haven't done the math on the gospel lately. We have forgotten. It is a theological tragedy. Consider that coming to the gospel meant being willing to let go of everything else just to have Christ anyway. Sell all your possessions, come follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Die to yourself and come after me. What does that say about anger? Leave it all behind. What does it say about what you're owed, what you expect, what you could desire in this life? Listen, if you had never another good thing after forgiveness, you have everything forever. God has been so kind. Our anger forgets the gospel. Let's move to the opposites of anger. Listen, we're going to be really angry if we have to go to a part three. How, how will we do this? Okay. Uh, one opposite of anger is self-control. Proverbs 16, 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules his spirit better than one who captures a city. You want to be a real man? You want to be tough? Conquer your anger. Another opposite of anger is simply faith. Faith rejects the idea of self-sufficiency. It rejects the notion that I need to manage my situation and take care of myself. Faith says, God cares for me. He's very much better at managing situations than I am. I trust him. 1 Peter 2.23, while being reviled, Jesus did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. He kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. And then Peter picks up on the theme of Jesus responding not angrily to mistreatment and applies it to us. 1 Peter 4.19, therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. That's the opposite of entrusting my situation to myself and my ability to manage it by getting what I want. Anger, revenge, manipulation, whatever. Another opposite of anger is wisdom. We read the Proverbs last week that told us that anger is folly. And Proverbs 2, I won't read it here this morning, but Proverbs 2, 1 to 5 are this gracious invitation from wisdom, from God, to approach and enjoy and benefit wisdom. Ed Welch said, At the center of wisdom is a willingness to forsake our pride and to get a little lower. Anger puts you above others, again, as the judge, jury, prosecutor. Wisdom brings humility and good listening and self-control all rooted in the fear of the Lord. The opposite of anger is wisdom. The opposite of anger is to overlook offenses, Proverbs 19.11. A man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. The opposite of anger is also humility. Turn to Genesis chapter 50. And, and there's, a, there's a kind of humility that is uh, meek in its demeanor. Um, that maybe is soft-spoken. Uh, th that's not the, the whole biblical definition of humility. You know that the, the one who is humble, Isaiah 66, is the one who trembles at God's word. I think John the Baptist humbly proclaimed 
coming judgment and warnings and a call to repentance. Uh, Moses, who was termed the humblest man on the earth, humbly spoke truth boldly, sometimes cowardly boldly, <laughs> trusting the Lord. But the humility I'm talking about here is, is not the, the soft-spoken, meek sort of lowness, but a theological humility. We find this in Genesis 50 in the story of Joseph at the end of his life. Uh, verses 14 to 21, we'll just highlight some of the points here. Verse 14, after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. The brothers saw that the dad was dead. Oh, no. Dad was the buffer between Joseph's anger and us. Now we're toast. Verse 18, his brothers came and fell down before him. Behold, we're your slaves. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. And listen to his rhetorical question. For am I in God's place? You meant evil against me. God meant it for good. In order to bring about what's happened to this day. To keep many people alive. Don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and for your children. Joseph was not angry with them precisely because of his theology. He said, well, God can be angry with you, but I'm not going to. I, am I in God's place? Joseph recognized he would be taking the role of divine judge over his brothers were he to maintain anger against them. This theological humility uh, is an important opposite of anger. And then just write down Colossians 3, 8 through 17. Ah, oh, we have to read it. We can't not. The, the opposites of anger are bundled up here in such a compelling way. Here's Colossians 3, 8. Lay these all aside. Wrath, anger, malice, slander, abusive speech. Don't lie to one another since you did put off the old man with its evil practices and you have already put on the new man who is being renewed to a full knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. And then look down at verse uh, 12. As the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, graciously forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord graciously forgive you, so also should you. Above all these, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Be thankful Sing with gratefulness in all that you do, do in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. What a remarkable, full-orbed package of anger's opposites. James 3 also bundles up the friends of anger. What, what holds hands with anger in the conflicts and quarrels? Bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, arrogance, falsehood, disorder, every evil practice, doubt, and hypocrisy. But James also bundles up a host of opposites of anger. Good conduct, he says, gentleness, wisdom, purity, peace, consideration of others, submission, mercy, good fruits, faith, sincerity, and peacemaking. Let's talk finally about the righteousness of anger. I alluded to it earlier and we hinted at it last week as we began. There is an anger that is right and holy and just and good. We, we can refer to a righteous indignation. We can talk about a righteous anger. But we know that God has this anger. We discover that God is slow to anger, Psalm 103.8. But in Psalm 5, we learn that God is angry with the wicked every day. Romans 1.18, his wrath is being revealed against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And we've been working our way through the book of Revelation where God's anger and wrath are being poured out in successive judgments on the earth dwellers during the end times. The lake of fire is, of course, an eternal expression of God's goodness 
in the presence of unrepentant sin, and it is anger, unceasing, unflinching, good, holy, bright, clean, pure, love of good, anger. Anger by itself is not sin. God does it without sinning. Jesus as well. You can write down Mark chapter 3 verse 5. Mark chapter 10 verses 13 and 16. Jesus was angered at hypocrisy. I believe at the, the tomb of Lazarus. He was angered by the hypocritical empty religiosity. And probably at the consequences of the effects of sin generally on his friend. In Mark 10 Jesus expresses anger over the unbelief that he saw around him. And if you were to catalog all of the anger in Jesus, you would get a handful of places where you see him angry in his earthly ministry. And you would have a whole host of places where Jesus was not angry where he had a right to be. In fact, if you just trace out Jesus' earthly ministry, you could not characterize him as walking around angry. <laughs> but mistreated, a lamb silent before his shearers, when reviled, not speaking evil in return. And you understand from the model of Jesus that he absorbed personal slights and as God in the flesh sinlessly expressed anger when God's glory was violated. And that begins to give us a right parameter. If we ask the question, can I be righteously angry? I would suggest to you that, that it is theoretically possible I don't know if I've ever experienced it. I don't know if I can judge that in myself. It is appropriate to be angry at things like trafficking and abortion and the ongoing rebellion against God's authority that is characterized by the whole world around us. Can I be angry at Satan? Somebody asked me this week. And in fact, out of the mouth of infants and babes, uh, a child... <laughs> Sat on my sidewalk out in front of my house. I hate Satan right now. <laughs> Listen, there's a category for that. But, but what I have a hard time doing is seeing it in myself untainted. I tend to be biased towards my own thoughts. I am fundamentally self-interested, self-protected. There is a minefield of sin with mixed motives and tainted desires in me that clouds everything that could be good, even if I have a category of good and righteous anger. Am I consistent? If I am truly righteously indignant, is it unwavering? And is it always about the glory of God? God has been offended? That, that's my thought through and through the whole way? I have a really hard time believing myself when I'm angry when I'm the offended party. No, 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 no. It, it's all about the glory of God. Trust me. I'm angry because when that person mistreated me, oh boy, God's glory. <laughs> I don't trust myself down that path. Ed Welch said, much, if not most, of our anger is sinful. Alec Motier, in his commentary on James, said, most of us would have to confess that holy anger belongs to a state of sanctification to which we have not attained. And I want you to turn to Ephesians 4.26. This is, this is the text. If Ephesians 4.26 is a command, be angry, then it is the only command in Scripture to be angry. And grammatically, it is ambiguous. We talked about this a little bit last week. Ephesians 4.26, be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin can be read as command, as an imperative. But it is not the only way grammatically that it can be read. It can be read as a concessive, a conceding. There are other examples of this in Scripture. Um, uh, John 2.19 Tear down this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. It's actually in the imperative mood. It's a command. Is Jesus telling the religious leaders to kill him? No. Is he even giving them permission to kill him? No. He's just saying, you're going to do this and I'll rebuild it. 
same grammatical structure as here in Ephesians 4.26. The NIV translates this, in your anger do not sin. It's the, sort of the modern English translation that, that commits itself to a concession translation. Most of the others leave it just ambiguous. Be angry and don't sin. If I said, run the red light and get your picture taken. I'm not commanding you. I'm not even giving you permission. <laughs> but you're going to do it. And look, you're going to get your picture in the mail in that little envelope. I think that's what's going on here. And we know from the context... Verse 26, if it's a concession, is saying anger happens. And the next thing that's said is, therefore, you need self-control. Don't indulge it. Don't let it sit there. You've got to do something with it. And then verse 27 gives us a serious danger. Satan will take advantage of it. And then verses 31, 32 give the prohibition. Put away all anger from you. The context seems like a strange place to insert a command. Hey, uh, we need to have a category for righteous indignation. Let me command you Christians, be angry. I don't think that's what he's doing. I think it's the opposite of that. And, and if you were to just put together all the New Testament instruction on anger, and if you want that, you can have my notes, email me for it. Um, you get a different picture about what's commanded and prohibited. And we ask, what about God and Jesus and other examples of godly people? Um, if I do take it as a concession or permission, um, can I have some help? Listen, if you just disagree with my take on Ephesians 4.26, if you're looking down at your study Bible notes and you're seeing a different answer, it's okay. Can I at least give you some help if you take this as command? If James tells us that sinful anger happens when I don't get what I want, righteous anger will only happen when God is not getting what he wants. That gives us some parameters. Uh, Lou Priolo gives some helpful parameters. Here, number one, righteous anger reacts against actual sin. Righteous anger focuses on God and his kingdom, his rights and his concerns, not me and my kingdom. And righteous anger is accompanied by other godly qualities and expresses itself in godly ways. Jesus was angry, but he didn't sin. Anger didn't come with all the compatriots. I have for you up on the screen the resources. You can snap a picture of that. And uh, I think our plan in, in January is to recommend Ed Welch's book. Uh, Ed Welch's book. We normally do a book of the month. I think we're going to do a book of the two month. You can just plan if you want to buy it now. Uh, Ed Welch in the, in the opening pages says it, it's a very short book. It is literally a small book about a big problem. And it's divided into uh, 50 chapters, which are all like a page or a page and a half long. And he's designed it to read one chapter a day, think about it, talk about it with your family. We're going to recommend that, that we do that together as a church. Now, I violated it because I had to read it in one week, <laughs> but now I've stopped, slowed down, and read it together, and I think we'll do that together as a church, but four minutes over. Since this was a message about anger, I know how you're supposed to respond to me letting you out a little bit late. In about 10 minutes, we'll regather for main service. <laughs>